Professor Jonathan Moreno uh, is, um, I, I have to quote it directly from the text, it's a pen integrates knowledge professor uh, in the University of Pennsylvania. I must say I didn't understand the, the title, but you're going to clarify it maybe. In, um, as well as a professor, and here I do understand, uh, of a professor of medical ethics, of the history and sociology of science, and most importantly for me, of philosophy. Uh, Professor Moreno has served on a long list of advisory boards and roles, and particularly relevant to our discussion today, uh, as an investigator in the Department of Defense project on artificial intelligence enabled neurotechnologies and warfighters. There's no way I can quote his numerous publications, but we'll just mention his recent book uh, on neuroscience, just a year or uh, two years ago. His list of publications is awesome, I must say, as is his breadth of mind, as we can see from the list of um, uh, titles he has at the university. So, uh, Professor Moreno, I'm very happy uh, to have you here in Jerusalem for this session. Thank you. Right. So, uh, first of all, don't start that clock until I tell you to. It's worth a try. Uh, so it's so wonderful to be here. Thanks to David and Yael and the, and the organizing committee. And I have to say, boy, this light's bright. Uh, I have to say, um, this is what I missed for two years. So it's wonderful to be, to be here for many reasons. So uh, what to say? Uh, th this, is the, um, this is the order of my topics. Uh, some caveats, something on big data, gene editing, neuroscience technologies, neurotechnologies, and bioethics, and the rules-based order. I'm really going to try to push uh, out the boundaries of the conversation today uh, beyond bioethics to uh, what you might call the world of uh, international relations. But that's for the end, and I hope I can get there in time. So first, some caveats. Uh, uh, back to uh, our, our friend uh, Dan Callahan, uh, my, who was my boss at the Hastings Center for a while in the 1980s. Um, he, he said uh, these were the early issues for the Hastings Center back in 1969. Uh, they also, uh, they, he said they were pretty much right, that these were going to be continuing unfolding issues in the 70s and 80s, except for behavior control, which is kind of interesting. Uh, SSRIs weren't, uh, the psychiatrists know what I'm talking about, the new drugs weren't quite there yet, they were just uh, emerging in the mid-70s. Uh, uh, the, uh, the old uh, forms of uh, uh, neurosurgery were fading out. Uh, uh, the, uh, so this was a period of, of transition in that area, and I think only now, really, in the last maybe 10 or 15 years, we're really looking more seriously at uh, brain and behavior control. Um, so you can see why Christine and I are friends, because we have the same, uh, we, we worship at the, uh, at the, uh, at the Yogi Berra um, <laughs> throne. Uh, but, but I also want to note uh, this um, uh, cautionary remark about uh, risk-benefit uh, analysis from David Collingridge. I don't know anything about David Collingridge, uh, but he said this, and nearly, actually Ari and I were talking with David Collingridge yesterday, made a very important contribution to uh, helping us worry about uh, how we can really manage technology. It's rather discouraging, uh, but yet we, we, uh, we press on. Uh, so just so you're not disappointed, this is the challenge that David uh, presented uh, to us for this session. Uh, you know, we can't always tell what, when old limits will turn out to apply to new technologies. Uh, not all old limits apply to new technologies, and indeed, uh, there might be new limits we haven't thought of yet because, you know, we are not so good uh, at predicting. Um, but I'm going to start by t talking a little bit about, about the implications of what we sometimes call big, big data, our large foundational data sets. Uh, um, later on, maybe a little bit about unlabeled data sets. So I, I think it's the case that um, the, this uh, puts the therapy research distinction, which was one of the, you know, there are, there are two big topics in the Belmont Report, of the National Commission. Uh, one was the principles that we're aware of, and we've heard about also from Alan and others, but also the distinction between research and therapy. So in, the commission was saying, you know, you owe people who are participating in, in research uh, to be very clear that the, the role, uh, their role is to help to advance human knowledge. They're giving their bodies uh, for the sake of advancing human knowledge, and therefore, 
the requirements for informed consent and so forth have to be higher than in, in regular treatment. But, um, and there are a lot of problems with that, but there's one emerging problem. This is an area that our, our, our colleagues at Johns Hopkins are worrying about for 10 or 12 years. This is the, the idea of the, um, of the learning health system. So I know there's a lot of going on on this slide, but the basic idea is captured in this circle here. In the learning healthcare system, research influences practice and practice influences research. So your data is going up to the cloud from your doctor's office, uh, and uh, there are some uh, algorithms going to be applied to scrape the data. It's going to compare you to lots of other people uh, with similar characteristics, and then it's going to tell your uh, physician uh, some recommendations for taking care of you. Um, and so the people at Hopkins have already done some work on some of the ethical issues, uh, the pillars of ethics required for, uh, for, the, for uh, the learning health system. Um, now, there are lots of issues here, intellectual property issues, right? Who owns my data? Well, I don't, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, privacy and confidentiality, let's hope it can't be hacked. Uh, good luck with that. Uh, you know, we heard about public health surveillance in the Israeli setting yesterday. That's uh, 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 you know, how much access does government have to this data if there's another uh, pandemic, God forbid, uh, as there most certainly will be. We know about problems of algorithmic bias, right? Uh, What's the data, where's the data set coming from? What kinds of people, do they look like me or do they look like somebody else? Um, and then, you know, this is a big one that we've really failed at in bioethics because the larger society does not provide access to healthcare. Why should I, if I'm, my data is going up to the cloud and there's some interesting information coming back to my doctor, but that information isn't, uh, it's not gonna do me any good because I don't have a decent health insurance. This is particularly a US problem. How is that fair? So I, this may be an intractable problem uh, for a, a learning health system, I think, from an ethics standpoint. So this is a very interesting company, Flatiron. Some of you may know about Flatiron. This is, uh, these are uh, young people who figured out, Wharton uh, uh, alumni, I must say, uh, who figured out that um, what pharma wants is data. They want data. And so they focused on oncology. And they, they noted that uh, at least 95% of Americans who have cancer uh, are not being taken care of in clinical trials. They're getting frontline therapy. Uh, often they're getting it from their internal medicine doctor. Uh, and all that data about how they do uh, is, is lost. How do they do in their treatment? Um, so they, uh, they went, uh, they got a chief medical officer, a, a, a well-known oncologist from Duke, and uh, they brought her in and they approached many uh, uh, practice settings and they collected data and they figured out how to do it and they had their, their algorithms, uh, and uh, you know, this was a, a, a very successful, uh, what you might call, uh, this was a finance play, right? Uh, they figured out what uh, the industry wanted, uh, and they provided a model, and as you can see, uh, and they were, by the way, these two young men were 32 years old uh, when they sold this uh, company to Roche for a whole lot of money, uh, $1.9 billion, that's more than Penn pays me in a whole year. So. Um, uh, and I think it was, you know, we, we're, we're, we're getting a lot of information. I think it was Vardit who mentioned, did you mention the voice stuff? So, you know, this is just one example of, uh, of the hunger for information, hunger for data that, that, that is happening in the AI world uh, that's going, that is certainly going to be attempted to be used for productively uh, in, in the future, not only in, in the research setting, but also uh, in, in the clinical setting. Now, this raises a kind of interesting potential conflict, right? Uh, now, for, for 20 years, uh, a patient has been able to do a search and come up with a review article about their medical problem and bring it into their doctor. Uh, they've been in Yahoo, Yahoo or Google. Uh, who remembers Yahoo anymore? Uh, and uh, say, Doc, this is what I want because I read this paper, uh, and this is what I want you to give me. And so there's that conflict already for a while, but this is getting more, a little more intense. Uh, so who treats me? Right? It, does, the, does the algorithm treat me uh, or does my doctor treat me? And there's a certain amount of pressure here. Uh, Nancy Cass, our, our, our colleague at Hopkins, I think put this very well. You know, it used to be that being on protocol meant that you were in a clinical trial, but in the future, we'll all be on protocol. Um, so, um, so think about the learning health system as one example here of big data. Here's another one that, uh, pharma has been interested in it for a couple of years, and it's only now beginning to emerge uh, in, in the bio. In fact, there's one bioethics paper that I could find that's just been published by, uh, actually, it's by, by the people at the University of Zurich. But let me start with this. So this is the idea of the digital twin. How many of you have, have heard the idea of the digital twin? Right. 
Hardly, well, okay, a few people have. You're, in, we're, we're, you're better informed than I am. So here's the, the basic idea that's expressed by Charles Fisher from this company. They take historical data, real world data, about a particular disease, how it progresses on current treatments, encapsulates it with a, within a computer model. Then if I enroll in a clinical trial, we take data from me at the beginning of the trial, put that into the model, and it creates simulations of what might happen to me in the future. Right? So this is kind of a digital patient. Right? But actually, um, there are more possibilities here, not just the traditional um, clinical data like my bloods, right? but also uh, it could be information about my step count on this thing. Uh, it could be information about um, what I've Googled. Right? Uh, it could be information about my social network. We know from people like Nick Christakis that there's this, this correlation between uh, proximity and social network and obesity. So there's a lot of data that can, can, uh, can go in here and create a simulated patient. Now, one way to think about this is that, uh, do you remember the Takamochi? Uh, the, when my daughter was nine, her, she and all her friends had it. This is late 90s. Had, how many of you had a Takamochi, right? A little uh, digital pet. Uh, some of you are smiling because you remember it. Well, now it's online. It's so much fun. But um, maybe it helped her with her parenting skills. We hope that she will be a parent soon. Uh, and uh, uh, because every five or six hours or so, she would have to push a button or the Takamuchi would starve to death, right? Catastrophe. So, um, but this is like a simulated, but now these are digital entities, digital patients. They are simulations. Um, now, look, I, Pharma is quite excited about this. I actually got a, an email last week from a, the CMO of a major pharmaceutical company sending me a couple of papers about digital twins. They think if this works, they could have, they have, could have fewer participants in clinical trials. Um, but so, and, by, and my colleague, uh, Conrad Cording at Penn, who's a computational neuroscientist, thinks this is, uh, this is just BS. Yeah. But uh, there are clearly people who are smarter than I am who think that this is worth investing in, this notion of a digital twin. So here are some of the problems. Obviously, security and privacy, eh, fair, that's, you know, we know about that, hacking and so forth. Uh, data bias, algorithmic bias, that's not new. Um, good gene pool. Could, if, that's, if that triggers uh, new kinds of eugenic worries, that could be a problem. Uh, and then, again, access. But, you know, inadequate access to the benefits of healthcare has not, in the U.S. at least, ever been an obstacle to doing more science. <laughs> it, we, don't, we just do the science and we, you know, we, we let the insurance issues, uh, that's, a, that's not our department, uh, as Werner von Braun said about the bombs. Um, so, uh, of course, you know, digital twins, it, let's take... I'm taking David's challenge seriously. Let's project 20 or 30 years. Maybe digital twins could contribute to a simulated universe. Uh, these would be simulated beings, the Takamuchi problem, right? Uh, could we ever let them die? Uh, so here we get into the fun stuff that um, Nick Bostrom at, at Oxford likes to worry about. You know, uh, he believes we are already living in a computer simulation, uh, uh, and we should hope we are, because otherwise if we die, it all goes away. But if we're in a simulation, then the good news is that there's always a record of this universe in which we live. Um, so uh, I actually wrote to Nick last week and sent him an article about digital twins. And he said, oh, yeah, sure, fine. This is all part of the deal. Uh, these are all going to contribute to the simulated uh, universe that we as simulates will create. All right, so on to uh, gene editing. Um, so, you know, CRISPR, uh, well, what a great expression, right? I mean, it, people got so excited about CRISPR uh, just because of, of, the, of the term. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we know that four years ago, Hojin Kui uh, had a little, uh, did not get the reception that he expected. I think it's fair to say. Um, somehow, all the people that he spoke to before he did this in, 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 uh, uh, in China and in the U.S., their heads are down. Right? They're not talking to anybody now. They've disappeared. This was not a rogue project. People knew about it. Uh, there's actually a, um, a documentary I just heard about a couple of days ago that's coming out uh, that, that uh, reviews the history of, how the, of all this, and, you know, and, and those people did not want to come forward and talk about this. So um, he actually got out of prison in April. I don't know if you know that. Uh, he and uh, two of his colleagues uh, were in prison. I have spoken to learned law professors in the U.S., and I said, could we even have a way of putting something, somebody like that in prison? I mean, the, 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 the Chinese decided we're going to... He, he, he was practicing medicine on the license. We're putting him in prison. Right? Uh, I don't even, it's not even clear to me how we could do that. I guess a state licensing board could do that. Uh, but uh, it's interesting that in the first days and weeks after this announcement, uh, there were a number of people 
who thought that the Chinese are just going to go full steam ahead and they're not going to give a damn about any international consensus about, about uh, editing genes, uh, about editing these babies. So this is what the Wall Street Journal said. Uh, John Cohen, a very well-known uh, science uh, writer in science, said, uh, you know, they were waiting for China to do something. He very much suspected they weren't going to do anything, that they were, that they were going to go their own way with respect to the ethics of this kind of, uh, of gene editing research. Um, but, um, you know, I think uh, our colleague at Stanford, Hank, really got this right. There was really a, a, a kind of yellow peril anxiety that was going on here. Uh, you know, if anything, uh, China reacted more strongly than the U.S. could, at least, to this, uh, to this incident. Um, but it is interesting, uh, and this I don't know how you know, this is going to work out, Eugene Kui is back in a lab. He went for prison back to the lab. I don't think that would happen in the U.S. I don't, I don't know why. Uh, so I have a brilliant undergrad uh, named Yu Ting Zhu, who is back in Shanghai for the first time in more than a year and a half with her parents. Um, and uh, she helped me with this work. It was published in the, on the Hastings Center Forum. Um, there has been a regulatory quasi -le backslash legal response in China, and we explain what that uh, response is. Uh, and you can read that blog post if you like to. But you know, sometimes I've heard people informally say, "Well, there's a red. There's been a red line between somatic cell editing and germline editing." I have looked in the literature for the red line. I cannot find it. This is from the uh, National Commission, the Presence Commission on Bioethics, 1982, uh, called Splicing Life, this report. Uh, and their concern is about eugenics. Right? Uh, it's not clear that there's a red line here philosophically, except for the practical implications of more really bad medical social policy if you stimulate a new uh, eugenics movement. And by the way, this is like an 80-some-odd page report, as I recall compared to the hundreds of pages we have now in bioethics, you know, they, did a, they, they wrote a pretty impressive report in 80 pages. So um, there's something I to learn there. Um, germline editing, well, uh, you know, the yellow light, according uh, to our national academies, uh, got to be careful here. Um, what you have to worry about ultimately is safety. Now, and the interesting thing is, we can get a consensus around safety. This is the same thing, with, by the way, with reproductive cloning. Right? You could get a consensus bad for the fetus, bad for the mother, uh, unsafe. But what if you could do reproductive cloning, human reproductive cloning, in a safe way? Would that be acceptable? That's where the rubber meets the road. Right? But often it comes down to safety. So what does it even mean to talk about safety with, with respect to future people? Uh, the, 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 I, this I don't really don't understand, um, uh, but you know, this, is, this is the way we've gone. So are, what are the ethical limits? Some, somatic cell editing, I think. Uh, most people say, at least in the U.S. context, go for it. Our, our standard regulatory regime can handle uh, the genetic modification of body cells. So, you know, really uh, great options for diseases like sickle cell, except that who's going to pay for it? <laughs> uh, another problem we have. But I don't think the germline has ever really been a, a red line. Um, there are the usual uh, justice issues. There are some science fiction scenarios that I, lo I, lo I love those, uh, and I've written about them. Uh, uh, but it's, it's just not a real, it's not a real red line. All right, so now uh, to neuroscience and, and neurotechnologies. I don't know if my video, well, my video will work. Okay, so maybe it'll work. I'm a Mac person, so I don't think this is going to work. It doesn't matter. So this is a system called optogenetics uh, developed by people at Stanford. The basic idea is you, you take opsin, uh, pro, uh, protein opsin, uh, you introduce it into the brain of, uh, of a rodent. Uh, oh, maybe, no, it's, oh, thank you. Thank you very much back there. The ghost in the machine. Uh, so basically what you can do is you can manage the rodent's feeding behavior uh, because these, the opsin is light sensitive, it comes out of the eye, and when it's, so you can see when the, when the light's on, this is chronically implanted by the way, right? So you can control the, the feeding behavior of this. Uh, right? People in neuroethics have the best movies, right? Uh, so this is salted butter popcorn. You don't need to use a light to get me to eat salted butter popcorn. Um, and when it's off, the rat is not interested in the, in the, in the salted buttered popcorn, unlike me. Um, so look, the brain is hot, as my colleague Martha Farah at Penn likes to say. These are the, the uh, national, indeed international, uh, neuroethics projects that some of you are familiar with. Um, so basically, I'm going to talk about a few topics if I have time, AI, brain reanimation, organoids, and brain-computer interface. So uh, neural networks are, an, this is an excuse for people like me to talk about AI. 
because they are a, a paradigm, a word I don't really like to use, I don't know what a paradigm is. And by the way, we're not really sure what AI is either, but we <laughs> say that all the time. Um, but I think it is useful to note that this is nested here. Deep learning is nested in machine learning. Machine learning is nested in whatever AI is. Uh, increasingly, people worry that AIs are writing their own codes. We were talking about this at dinner, actually, last night. Uh, scientists can't explain how it works. How do they get to their conclusions? Uh, but, of course, nobody knows how the brain gets to its conclusions either. Um, but this does pose some problems like algorithmic bias. Uh, also, for national, I work in national security and, and medical ethics. Uh, in the national security world, they're supposed to know how their, how their AI got to a certain conclusion. For example, if it's um, developing a data set, a target set out of data about uh, what uh, armed drone to use on what target, they are supposed to be able to figure out how the system chose that target set. Right? So that is a problem in the military setting. Um, but if you really you know, want to have fun with this, are we at the singularity yet? Uh, so uh, you know, Werner Vinga, uh, Kurzweil, Elon Musk, uh, Hawking, uh, uh, they really like this book by uh, Nick Bostrom. You know, maybe we are approaching the singularity when AIs will uh, take over. Uh, it's interesting to me, and you know, this is what I wrote in this little, bo this little uh, blog post uh, over on the right, we worry a lot about making mice smarter. We have, right, we have animal care committees for that. We're not, we don't seem to be worried about making computers smarter. There's no, there's no IRB for, what, uh, for, for what, how computers are getting smart, if they are, which is, you know, so we can argue about that. Uh, this fellow, this poor guy, Blake Lemoyne, thought that his chatbot was sentient, uh, and he went public with this, uh, like the movie Her, right? Uh, and he was fired. So you've got to be careful what you say. Um, this is a, a, a project uh, from, uh, from uh, Yale. I actually re reviewed the Nature paper uh, of, of this project, uh, the reanimated pig. To, I guess they wanted me to decide if it was kosher or not. <laughs> How often can you use that? Uh, so um, uh, my only question, I didn't understand the technology. This is like four years ago. I didn't understand the technology. But my question was, where was the Animal Care Committee? And the answer is, the pig was a food source. Food source, right? Uh, now, at what point, when you reanimate, they're doing dozens more, by the way, at what point does it become a, 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 an object <laughs> for uh, the concern of the Animal Care Committee? We don't know yet. Uh, cerebral organoids, uh, uh, Chris mentioned these, uh, really interesting uh, laboratory model, kind of a wet lab model. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to, by the way, I'm happy to share my slides because I know you, if you want these sites, I'm happy to share them. Um, what if you took uh, some, some of my brain cells, what if I have something called remnant memory, and you put them in a rodent? Chris alluded to this. What does that mean, right? We, don't even, we haven't solved the problem of other minds, so far as I know, uh, but you know, uh, David is more of the philosopher than I am. Uh, so is that, is that an issue? Um, uh, should we be worried about this? I wrote this paper a few years ago with some neurosurgeons at Penn who are doing, putting transplants uh, into rodents, um, and can we have the ghost of the machine uh, run this? run this video. So um, would this be a threat to the natural order? I think a lot of people are worried about evolution. Maybe I have to do this. Let's see if I can do this. Oh, never mind. It's a video. It's a little video from Planet of the Apes. So you can watch the movie. Um, so uh, so brain, briefly on brain-computer interface, I think you know what this is. I think there are about 36 people uh, right now who have Utah or the Utah array implanted uh, in the lab and they're learning how to manage their environment through a computer and so forth. Um, the U.S. Department of Defense has been interested in this for a long time. This is a, uh, this is a slide that just shows how we're, the hope, the hope is that you won't have anybody who's got to have a, you know, anything implanted physically, but you can have something on the top of the head or between the tissue and the skull, a non-surgical neural interface. That's what people really want. Uh, and so uh, the U.S. DOD has been invested in this for a long time. Um, there are some really cool uh, experiments that people like Jack Allen at, at, uh, at Berkeley have done. Maybe you've seen this video. I'm not going to. But this is basically putting somebody in, a, in an MRI and you can you, and show them a movie and you can recreate the image. Uh, this is Jack Allen did this 12 years ago. It's, not, it's sort of routine. Now, interesting question. What about your dream images? Would you dream uh, about something or something? Could, you, could your dream images be reconstructed in the lab? And the answer is yes, <laughs> uh, more or less. Uh, by this Japanese lab, is this mind reading? We've been worried about mind reading for a long time. Are they really a threat to brain privacy? Eh, that's a question. I don't know. 
But what is really a live question, and this is now getting into clinical ethics, is what about somebody in a min minimally conscious state? If this stuff bears out, could you uh, use a, a brain-computer interface to, to, to allow somebody in a minimally conscious state to uh, communicate with you? Um, obviously, there are big safety issues here. There are issues about personal identity. Uh, e uh, Elon Musk, and by the way, I said to Vardy, don't, don't give Elon Musk any ideas, right? Because uh, SpaceX and Neuralink, right? He's going to put them together, and he's going to implant uh, his chip into your brain while you're uh, going around the moon. Uh, look. I don't know if this is a research ethics problem or what it is, but this seems wrong to me, right? I mean, you know, I told workers his brain chip startup uh, to imagine, imagine they had bombs strapped to their heads to make them work faster. Wow, I want to be in that union. I don't think that's, I just don't think that's very good. Um, there is something going on called lifestyle neuroscience, uh, which purports to uh, improve your cognition, your emotional quality of life in various ways. I love this, especially this older couple on the upper right. I know my wife and I have been together for many, many, many years. You know, I don't know if we really need, we're so happy together. Do we really need the, well, maybe, we could, maybe it would be a little bit better. Um, but certainly for young folks who are undergoing anxiety, perhaps it would be a good thing. Depression, there's sure is a hell of a lot of that right now among younger folks. My colleague uh, and former postdoc, Anna Wexler, uh, did a little uh, survey of some of these commercialized devices. And, you know, these are the, these are the, uh, uh, the, the kinds of problems that they purported to be able to help you with. Uh, again, you know, caveat emptor, right? Let the buyer beware. Uh, so this is what I'm really interested in right now. Let's talk about the next, the era in which we are uh, I, I th perhaps emerging in the next 20 or 30 years. I think we need to reframe how we understand what I, modern bioethics or the, the medical ethics that was transformed through the patient's voice, uh, as I like to call it, in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And what I think we have forgotten and need to recapture is the fact that modern human research ethics was intentionally attempted to be brought under the, the rules-based order that the U.S. and the Allies developed after the Second World War. Right? So this is the famous first sentence of the, of the Nuremberg Code. Um, we have, I think we failed to appreciate how significant it would be for bioethics. It's a small niche area, I know, given all the other problems the world has. How's, if the world's based order is diminishing, what does that mean for bioethics? So um, is the rules based order is sometimes called the liberal international order. You know, this is my argument. Um, think about, for example, the idea of universal human equality. Why should, why should a research subject in Thailand or in Israel or in, the, or, or in the U.S., why should they all have the same expectations about getting valid informed consent? This was not, a, this was not an assumption that people made before the rules-based order uh, post-World War II. By the way, rules-based order has been very good for some countries, right? especially the, the American hegemon, as the political scientists like to call it. But, but it has created a, some stability. That stability, I think, now is, uh, is being undermined. We don't know where it's going to go uh, as a result of the war in Ukraine. Um, I think uh, I, I published a paper with a colleague at University of Miami, Sergio Lechuca, uh, on the question of of whether uh, what's happening uh, in, in Russia and the Russian Federation, there's already been problems with cl uh, clinical trial reliability in Russia. Uh, this is not coming from me. The, the Russian Academy itself was worried about th this in a report in 2021. Um, this Ru Russian scholar uh, said something I think quite interesting. The Nuremberg Code was only translated into Russian in 1986. Uh, so, uh, and there are other problems that Sergio and I talk about where Russia is not only isolating its science, it is, it is not being isolated in science, it is self-isolating in science. Uh, and to take a big player, not one of the biggest, but one of, a big player in, in science, particularly in the life sciences, out of the picture uh, as part of the potential diminishment of the rules-based order, I, I think that's uh, something for us to worry about. So uh, this is the problem. Uh, we're talking about limits. Who sets the limits? without a rules-based order. We've been somewhat uh, able to do that uh, since the late 1940s. It's not clear where we're going with that. So I wanna, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank again uh, David and Yael and all the organizers. And uh, that's my thank you slide. I have no uh, financial conflicts to report. I have a lot of emotional conflicts, but uh, that's, that's it for me. Thank you.